Well, good evening to you all. To those of you that I've already said good evening to, and to those of you who are looking at this on playback, it's good to see you all again. And tonight we're going to be looking at the last section of the Lord's Prayer. So I'm just going to remind you of the passage of scripture. Uh, I'm reading from the New, Inter the New International Version. And the passage is found in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 to 15. And it says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So, yes, this is the last part. And so the next phrase is, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's the last petition, and a petition is a request, a supplication, or an appeal. And all the phrases that we've looked at are petitions. So lead us not into temptation. That's a petition. But deliver us from evil. Another appeal to God. And that phrase, lead us not into temptation, hints at Jesus's absolute revulsion and hate of evil. Because it's in temptation that evil drives home its personal attack on us. When we're tempted, we have to resist really hard. Otherwise, that personal attack will come and we will succumb. You know, God doesn't deliberately lead us into, tempta into temptation because he can't be tempted by evil. And being tempted isn't evil, but succumbing to it is. And if you read Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 to 11, you'll see that Jesus is tempted while he's in the wilderness. But he didn't sin. He resisted the temptation. And so often it's when we're in the wilderness that the temptations come. Have you found that? But we have to stand strong like Jesus did. And what did Jesus do? He stood on the word. He used texts from the Bible to rebuke the devil. He knew God's truths. He knew God's standards. Do we? We may think we do. But can we hand on heart say that we keep to those standards? Do we keep to God's truths? I know I don't, 
but I know I should. You see, in Christ's spiritual armour was the sword of the Spirit, God's holy word. God's holy and living word should be living inside each of us. I'm not such an idiot that I think we can all learn the Bible off by heart all the way through. Well, I know I couldn't do it. The Old Testament uh, people learned the whole of the Torah. I wouldn't even be able to do that, I don't think. But even if we can't learn it all off by heart so we know where to pick our verses when we need them, if we read the word enough, some of those phrases that we will need are put into our brain. And because the brain is an invention of God himself, it is so intricate that things we think we've forgotten, he will bring to mind. So when we're in the wilderness, and if we face temptation, all we have to do is ask Holy Spirit to bring the right scripture to mind, and the devil will be rebuked. And if you aren't, aren't too sure about the armour of God, although we have mentioned it in the, the last two or three weeks, you'll find that in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 20. And make sure you've got your armour on every day. As Giselle often says, it doesn't say in the Bible that we must take our armour off. We mustn't. But we can check every day that everything is in place. That the sword of the spirit isn't across my back where I can't get it. That my helmet isn't under my arm because it's too hot to put it on. Make sure that every piece of armour is in the right place every day because it protects you from evil. And the second thing Jesus did, besides using the word, was to pray. The Bible often says Jesus drew away to pray, doesn't it? He went to replenish his spiritual reserves in the company of his heavenly father. Sometimes we sit down to say our prayers or we lie down to say our prayers or we kneel down to say our prayers, however we say our prayers. We spout them out. I might be unfair to people there, but you're thinking about what you're saying and you, you deliver your prayers to God. And then when you finish, you say, Amen, and you sit back down and you go and get on with the rest of your day. Now, I'm sure to an extent Jesus did that, but I just have that feeling. But when Jesus went away to replenish his spiritual reserves in the company of his heavenly father, he didn't just say a prayer and walk away. He sat and enjoyed his father's company. How many times do we just sit and talk to God in a conversational way and enjoy his company? Now, if Jesus, the perfect man, was compelled to do that, then how much more should we be taking time out with God to refresh our spiritual lives? And through the use of the Bible and through the fellowship of prayer, we can find a great love for God. We've said this before, the more you pray, the more you want to pray. The more you read his word, the more you want to read his word. And we'll find that great love for God. And that love will become so strong, it will keep us strong in the hour of our temptation. So let's move on to the next 
petition, but deliver us from evil. Evil, the evil one, our inward sin, addiction, political orders, rulers, natural disasters, accidents, disease, all of those can be evil. And because Jesus took our sins in himself on the cross, all those things that I've just mentioned and others besides were with him as he hung there waiting for death. Now, my sin alone would cause deep hurt when I was finally put to death because of them. If you can imagine all the believers, well, not all the believers, because we wouldn't be believers, would we, if we did this, but can you imagine the whole of the world that hasn't reconciled its, itself to Jesus and to God? The weight of those sins, the agony those people would go through because of those sins. And Jesus took all of those into his own self. And they were there when he hung on that cross. The power of evil is terrible. And I don't think terrible is adequate a word to describe what it is. But that evil is overcome by the power of God that finally triumphs. And it finally triumphs because of Jesus' sacrifice. So we've been given a glorious hope. Jesus saves. It's as simple as that. Jesus saves. He will deliver us from evil. We shall be last, we shall receive everlasting life. And I've just got one or two points of things that you need to keep in mind when you come to the Father in prayer. First of all, ask the Lord to keep you open to his voice so that you can follow in his ways. We've talked before about hearing God's voice. Is it an actual voice in your head? Is it a voice that comes from somebody else who you're talking to? Is it a voice that comes to you or a feeling that comes to you as you read his word? It can come to us in many ways. It may come in a dream. It may come in a picture. But as you go to speak to the Lord, ask him to keep, keep yourself open to his voice so that you can follow in his ways. Also, ask him for discernment to be able to tell which, what is right and what is wrong. Some people seem to have an intuitive discernment. Sometimes I don't think I've got any discernment at all. But I know when I need it, God gives it me. Sometimes you get that cold feeling when you go into a building or a house or somewhere that you've never been before and you get that cold feeling and you think I don't want to be in here. Sometimes you meet somebody and you start talking to this person maybe that you've gone to a gathering somewhere and this person comes and starts to talk to you. And somehow you know within yourself that that is a person that you do not want to get to know too well. That's all discernment. So ask him for that so that you can tell right from wrong. And I know we've got our armour on. 
but you can also ask him to cover you with his precious blood to protect you. You can pray that on your families, that he will protect them by his precious blood so that they will be moved to belong to him. Some of them may already belong to him, but they still need the protection of his blood. We also need to thank him for the seal that he laid on you when you became a Christian. And I'm just going to read this to you. It's only two verses. Just give me a minute while I, while I just find the passage. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And I am getting there. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 to 22. And it says, <coughs> it says 20, 21. Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Now, I don't know about you, but that makes me feel rather good, because there's going to be, come a day when evil is going to rule this world. And the only thing that we've got apart from the way we behave, to distinguish us from others is the seal that God gave us when we accepted him as Saviour and Lord. And that seal proves to the enemy that you belong to God. He's not going to be very pleased about that, but stand firm. Pray the blood of Jesus over you. Make sure your armour is in place. Listen for his voice. Discern what's happening to you. Most of all, praise him. Praise him for loving you. And praise him for wanting the very best for you. Because that is what he wants because he's your loving father. So praise him, whatever the circumstance, praise him. So now we're going on to the final section. And this section, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever, is actually a doxology. It was added on later, as you noticed when I read from Matthew, it wasn't on the end there. So this was added later. So first of all, the kingdom. His kingdom rules over everything. If you think about his creation, he spoke it into being. He asked for there to be light and there was light. So we should never lose the sense of grandeur regarding his creation. And I'm sitting here now watching the rain fall down outside. And yet I can still look over onto the horizon and see the green of the hills and the grey of the sky. And I can still be wrapped up in the beauty of it all. And God brings good out of the evil that passes through our world. We already know the kingdom is going to come in our world. In fact, it's already seen in those of us who have already given our lives to Jesus. But it's in all those people, the host of people, that have accepted him as their Lord and Saviour 
and those who have given him their allegiance. So within us, we have the kingdom. The Holy Spirit is there with us. Nothing, nothing can stop the march onward of his kingdom. And we need to be ready for it. We need to be there preaching the kingdom and bringing people into the kingdom. And secondly, the power. The great power is love. God has chosen to win us through love. He's not like those conquerors of old. And I say of old, but the last war was when, 1940 here, 1939. And wars are still going on, I know. But God doesn't approach us to slay us or slay our families or conquer us through swords or, or guns or anything like that. He doesn't want to take us over by force. He wants to win us through his love. And the place where we most see that revelation of love is on the cross. Christ's love for us held us there. No, no, it didn't. Christ's love for us held him there. He died on that cross, taking, as I've said, the weight of all our sins. And what did he do while he was there, going through the, all that agony? He asked the Father to forgive the people that had put him there, because they knew not what they did. Have we got the strength to do that? Have we got strength to forgive the people that have hurt us? And be able to say, I forgive them, Lord. Will you please forgive them? For they knew not what they were doing. Well, Jesus did. And he gave his love so graciously. That he's already won an empire. His power. Is an un discourageable love. Nothing will quench that love. Nothing we do, nothing we don't do, can take away that love that God has for us. And nothing we say and nothing we don't say can take it away either. Because love is his power. And love overcomes everything. And then thirdly, the glory. The glory. There is glory in the creation. But there's an even greater and more wonderful glory to be seen in the love that accepted the crucifixion. It's the glory of that sacrificial love that will eventually cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And that quote, by the way, is from Habakkuk 2, 14, and also from Isaiah 11, 9. Sacrificial love. Do we display sacrificial love? Would we die for somebody else? I think sometimes the nearest thing I could ever get to it is doing something for somebody when I didn't really want to do it and I was sacrificing something that I wanted to do. Could I give my life for somebody else? I hope I could give my life for my family members. But Jesus just did it. 
I mean, we read in the in the passage in the Garden of Gethsemane that he said, if you if you will take this cup away from me, take it. But he immediately said, no, that's not your will. Your will be done. And that's what we need to start to say as well. Your will be done, Lord, so that we can see your glory come on this earth. And so we conclude this Lord's Prayer with a petition of praise. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. So let's bow our heads. Let's be still for a moment. And lose ourselves in wonder, love and praise. Now let's say the Lord's Prayer together, shall we? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And that's all I have for you tonight. A nice short one. A nice short one tonight because last time it was rather long. But I hope you have got something out of this study that we've done on the Our Father. Um, I think it's always good to look back at it and study it and see what it really means, what we should be thinking when we're saying it and not rush through it like we sometimes want to do. So for those of you that are watching on playback, thank you very much for being with us. We hope that uh, you've had a, a good evening and we look forward to seeing you again soon. If you have any questions, then all our the details are below the screen and until we see you again good night and god bless mm -hmm.